Thank you. Thank you. It's what an amazing and electric, eclectic collection of talks. So we have a lot of fans in the, in the stories tonight. And we're going to continue a little bit more about that. But we also have a bunch of science. Anybody? <laughs> Anybody actually observe the transit of Venus back in 2004 and 2012? Yeah. Holler. Yeah. Nice. I love my nerds in the house. So this story is about why the celestial event is so popular. Uh, this is some, a helpful uh, little pamphlet that Aneta found from archive.org. I spent at least 10 hours researching this talk, and this never came up. So props to Aneta for finding that. Basically, Google Translate tells me that this says, the Kingdom of France commissioned this gentleman, whose name I'm probably going to butcher, Guillaume Le Gentil, to go and study the transit of Venus that was happening in 1761 and 1769. So two consecutive uh, occurrences separated by eight years. Why, though? Because these are part of some real celestial events. What is rare? Is a solar eclipse rare? This is actually a picture I took in Chile in, in the solar eclipse that just happened this earlier this year, uh, July uh, of this year. And when is the next solar eclipse? It's December 2020, so not too far. And it's in Chile again. Um, it's, it's in, Patag it's in uh, Patagonia, if anyone's interested to find out. So solar eclipse, not that rare. Halley's Comet. Um, the next one is in 2061. Some of us still hope to be alive by then. Some of us still hope to have a planet by then. But what's a rare rest celestial event, especially when it comes to our own solar system? It is, as you may have guessed from the talk, uh, title of this talk, the transit of Venus, which happens in pairs, separated by roughly eight years. I was hoping to show a video over here, but I've been in engineering all my life, and I tried to import this from a Google Slides into a keynote. <laughs> yeah, bad idea. That's a real picture, though. That's, not, that's taken by NASA. That's, that's a real picture of the transit of Venus. Uh, obviously, uh, we can see the solar flares because it, it's super zoomed in. But how rare is this? When is the next transit of Venus going to happen? Anyone planning to be alive by then? Anyone hoping to be alive by then? <laughs> yes. I might look a little bit more like that. So coming to our uh, protagonist of this story, and I'm going to make only one attempt to say this. Apologies, apologies to any French-speaking French people in the house. Guillaume Joseph Hyacinthe Jean-Baptiste Le Gentil de la Galassière. <laughs> or as we're going to call him for the rest of the talk, 3G. This is, my, uh, this is my favorite part of the talk. So we are actually going to do some math. Let's find out why the transit of Venus was so important. This is the 18th century. We know the ratio of the planet's distances to the sun. Kepler already did that for us uh, a few hundred years ago. We know what the diameter of the Earth is, but nobody really knows what the true distance from the Earth to the sun is. And in, you have to remember this is 1760s when people don't know what their country's map looks like. And imagine being, imagine being the country, the civilization that can tell, we know the accurate distance from Earth to the sun. That's powerful. So how are we going to plan to calculate this? Um, R denotes the distance from Earth to the sun. The little thing over here, that's Venus and obviously uh, Earth, not drawn to scale, should be <laughs> fairly obvious. Um, what we were trying to do during this, and this was proposed by uh, Halley, was have two uh, observers at the opposite ends of uh, the planet. And again, this was supposed to be a little bit more uh, obvious, but I imported Google Slides into Keynote, so. <laughs> The, the angle over here, the angle that the Earth moves in the time that it takes Venus to go from one side of the sun uh, to like completely transit across the sun, that angle is fairly easy calculable if you have two observers, two astronauts at the opposite ends of the Earth. Think San Francisco and New Delhi. Um, or as in this case, France and somewhere in the Indian Ocean. We know the 
365 days is 360 degrees around the sun. So a transit of Venus takes roughly about six hours, that's one fourth of a day. So we can calculate what this angle should be. If it takes 365 days to go around the sun in 360 degrees, how much time does it, or what is this angle for one fourth of a day? Simple ratios. And that's just me showing that math over there. So that's what we're going to call theta E. 2 pi 360 times t2 minus t1 is the time it takes for Venus to transit across the sun, divided by t, uh, the transit of Earth, which is 365 days. So we know how much the Earth has moved during the time that Venus has transited across the Earth. That's a, the, the diameter of the Earth plus that distance, uh, re, uh, the Earth to sun, time, uh, sun radius times that angle, r theta. We can do the same thing for Venus. Right, so we know what that angle for Venus is going to be if we know what this distance is. But because the sun is such a ginormous blob, that distance is roughly the same from the edge of the sun to Venus. And what that means is that the, even though this diagram is not obvious uh, because I imported from Google Slides into Keynote, <laughs> the angle that the Earth traces out versus the angle that Venus traces out is the same. And so we can do some uh, fun geometry over here and take some ratios and use Kepler's third law, which tells us that the ratio for this should be 0.72, and come up with a nice formula where the only, uh, depend the only unknown variable is r, which is the distance from Earth to the sun. We have, now you all have figured out how to calculate the distance from Earth to the sun when the next transit of Venus occurs, if you are alive. So coming back, um, so the, the, the European astronomers had figured out that this is a unique moment. This is not going to happen for another 120 years. We need to have people making these observations uh, when this transit of Venus is happening. So this is also before the Swiss Canal was built. So you had to go all around Africa, uh, which took a few months. This is, so our protagonist, 3G, left in the summer of uh, 1760, hoping to make it uh, to the farthest part that he could get to observe the transit uh, away from Europe. There were uh, his colleagues that were planning to observe it from Iceland, so he wanted to be as far away from them as possible to make the equation accurate. So he tried to get to India in the summer of 1760. If any of you know anything about the Indian monsoon, it's a really bad idea to go there in June and July. 3G, his ship got blown off course. He was planning to be there for the uh, transit that was, was going to happen in July 1761. By March of 1760, he's still stuck in the Indian Ocean and he's still trying to figure out how to get there. Now, this is 1761. For the European history nerds, what does this mean? The Seven Years' War has broken out. The place that 3G was trying to get in India is a part of India called Pondicherry, which at that time was a French colony, Boo colonialism. Um, but, but it was French speaking, so he wanted to go there. Um, but before he could make his way there, the British had overtaken uh, the, 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 the territory of Pondicherry. And now 3G is stuck at sea, battling the monsoon in the summer um, while not being able to land on Pondicherry, which um, is over here, the green region over here. He's, he, he has no way to go. He can come back to Mauritius, which is a French territory, and try to make the observations from there. But come July 1761, Venus is transiting and he's still on a ship. He's trying to make his observation. But yeah, that kind of doesn't work if you're on the sea and if you're trying to really accurately measure when Venus is transiting the sun. Ship science. Ship science. Good thing, though, that these things happen in pairs. So while 3G is still waiting on Mauritius, he has an option. Should I go back to France and come back here again because the government is paying for it, socialism? Um, or, or, you know, it's only eight years. This is like the 18th century. You know, people don't have a whole lot going on other than looking at the night sky and trying to figure things out. So 3G decides, I'm going to stay. But I've had enough of in the Indian monsoon and enough of the British uh, thwarting my plans. So he decides to go to the Philippines for the next one, which is in 1769. And in the intervening eight years, what does he do? Like everybody else, he just sits on an island and sips a margarita and just studies the stars. 
summer of 1768, he decides to, you know, finally make his way to Manila and uh, observe the transit from there. It has now been overtaken by the Spanish. The Spanish are like, we don't know who you are, you French-speaking person, you're probably a spy, you're not welcome here. Oops. <laughs> Pictures from Pondicherry, you know, it's not, it's not that bad of a place. So. The Seven Years' War has ended at this, at this point in time. The French have, overtake, uh, have uh, control of Pondicherry back again. So 3G decides, okay, fine, I cannot get to Manila. I'll come back to Pondicherry. And this time he comes there, and he just stays there and waits and waits and waits. He builds a whole gigantic observatory over there. Finally, it's 1769. He gets to observe the transit of Venus, this big celestial moment that is only going to happen once in their lifetime, once in even our lifetime. Um, the equivalent experiment, scientific experiment today is, would be probably the Large Hadron Collider. There were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of scientists that were mobilized to study, uh, to study this transit so that we could accurately determine the distance from the Earth to the Sun. And he is there. He's ready with his, uh, his, his uh, telescope. He's, uh, the sky is clear. There are no British on the horizon. There is no disease, nothing. He's ready on the morning uh, of the uh, transit to, uh, to, to take measurements. This is a picture from my own experience of the solar eclipse that happened in the US in 2017. <laughs> I went to southern Illinois because that's where the longest uh, eclipse was going to happen. I traveled 2,500 miles, nothing compared to, uh, to 3G's uh, journey, but I also wasn't being subsidized by my government. Uh, I kid you not, literally minutes before the eclipse began, maybe you can just about make out that it's almost a full eclipse over there. We had this crowd and, uh, cloud, and we were watching in a stadium with about 40,000 other people from age ranges 7 to 70, all cheering on, move, move, move <laughs> to the cloud. And I'm kind of imagining that's probably what 3G felt. His chance is gone. His chance at glory is gone. What do you do? He's like, obviously, you're devastated. So, right, I guess I should go home. Hopefully, my family has received all the letters I sent them over the years. 3G returns home. It takes him a total of 11 years from the time he left to the eight to nine years that he spent in, on the Indian Ocean in the Indian subcontinent, battling dysentery, battling the Spanish telling him that he's a spy and so on. 11 years later, he comes home and he, he walks in and he knocks on the door and he's like, hey honey, I'm home. And his wife opens the door. Like, I don't blame her, she, he was away for 11 years. He was a fairly rich man. All his, uh, all his siblings basically divided up his estate amongst them because he was gone for 11 years. He was, he was working at the Royal Academy of Sciences. Look, if you're not going to give me any scientific output for 11 years, I'll probably kick you out as well. But all of this happened because he was declared legally dead by the state of France. None of his letters, none of his communication for 11 years ever made it back to France because this is the 1760s and there is war and there, is, there are shipwrecks and all of everything is going on. He spent 11 years on the sea and he came back to a place where he was legally declared dead, his wife has remarried, he's lost all his money and he's lost his job. Yeah, you thought you had a rough evening today? <laughs> oh, by the way, and no data. He, didn't even, he never got to observe the, the transit of Venus. Yeah, that's kind of what I imagine that he felt like when he got back. So um, that's, a, that's a sad, misfortunate story, but I kind of see um, you know, a, a passion from a person who wanted to give everything that he could to study a super rare celestial event, which we know that the next one is going to happen in 2117. <laughs> We hope we have a planet by then. Can we get some non-stable geniuses in the government, please? <laughs> so that, uh, that, that's all for this talk. I'd like to raise a toast 
to the guile, the passion, the, the determination that 3G showed uh, all in the pursuit of science. And I hope that at least some of us get to observe this transit of Venus next time it happens, even if we look something like this.